Hey, in 2023 we dedicated quite a few videos to the F-35. It was a year that was rich in news but also new insights and interesting details emerged about this aircraft. So I thought that it was interesting to have all the videos all together in a single long format. Enjoy! So, the announcement of the APG-85 as the new radar for the F-35 came out of the blue. Particularly considering that the APG-81 is one of the most advanced radars in the world. The APG-85 will be the mainstay of the Block 4 aircraft that are going to arrive at some point in the future. Now, obviously, both the APG-81 and the APG-85 are AISA radars. Now, everybody knows that AISA is much better than PISA and even better than anything that has ever existed before. And flipping nobody cares of explaining you why. Because even if you think you know why, and you may because you're watching this channel, well, no, you don't. So, uh, the radar antenna with a reflector is an instant cultural meme. This shape is universally recognized as a radar antenna. And I'm sure that you know that a radar works emitting a pulse of electromagnetic energy and receiving a reflection from a target. So, let's move on. Since its first use in World War II, radar has evolved a lot. And each technology evolution was because there was a problem to fix. To make a long and fascinating story short, well, once it was the accuracy of the detection because the beam was not sharp enough. Another time was eliminating the ground clutter to be capable of looking down and shooting down. And later it was the track while scan capability. But despite all of this, the basic shape didn't change much. Then, in the early 70s, flat antennas started to appear, like these, for example. So the question is, what had changed? Well, actually, they look remarkably similar to a modern AISA radar. Why are they different? Well, the antenna is not that much different, at least as a concept. It is an array antenna that is an antenna made of smaller antennas all arrayed together in the same assembly. And antenna arrays are nothing new or high-tech. In fact, this type of antennas have been in use since the 40s for radio or TV transmissions. These antennas have two advantages. One, the signal-to-noise ratio improves with the number of elements in the antenna. This is easy to understand. For example, the received signal can be added all together and they are correlated, so they just sum, while the noise, which is not correlated, doesn't sum linearly. Even with few components, you can have several decibels of improvement of the signal-to-noise ratio. Two, it is possible to use the interference between the elements to create a very narrow beam with very small side lobes. And if you don't know what the side lobes are and why they are a problem, well, that's easy to understand. This is the radiation reception pattern of a generic radar antenna built with the conventional technologies. So energy is emitted through the side lobes and is also received through the side lobes. And when it happens, you have no way of telling if the received signal is coming from the side lobe or from the main beam. So the key point is that when designing an antenna array, it is possible to determine the emitted and received power as a function of the arrival or the transmission angle. In simpler words, this antenna can be very directional. This is the case of the flat antennas, and obviously the privileged direction is perpendicular to the antenna plate. Uh, I know, I know, this is not Pisa or Aiza, but bear with me because this is going to be important later. What is the flip side of these antennas? Well, uh, they are larger and more complex than a normal reflector. And complexity and the associated costs are a factor because behind these antennas there is a web of waveguides that connect the single antenna elements to the amplifier and the emitters of the radar these components are quite delicate, they're not very reliable, and their design is extremely difficult. 
Moreover, these antennas, when used on a fighter aircraft, they don't fix one painful problem that they still have in common with the previous generations. They do require mechanical steering. Now, obviously, every mechanical component that has to withstand 9 Gs is just going to be less reliable than solid-state components. But this is not the worst problem of mechanical steering. Mechanical steering is required because the direction of the target is determined by the orientation of the antenna, while the distance is calculated by timing the pulse. A mechanically steered antenna takes quite a lot of time to explore the space around the aircraft. We are talking times around 10 or 20 seconds to explore uh, the frontal hemisphere and maybe not even all of that. Functions like track while scan are very complex to implement in these kind of radars, but critically the radar can do just one thing at a time. It either can be in air-to-air -air mode or air-to-ground mode or navigation mode or whatever. So, something was required to go beyond this point and honestly the solution was under everybody's nose. In fact, in a normal flat antenna, we obtain an, a narrow beam by the geometry of the antenna, but also by governing the phase of the signal being emitted. Now, in a conventional flat antenna, the phase delay between the different elements is fixed by design. But what if we introduce a variable delay by a component that we can call a phase shifter that can be controlled by a computer. In this way, we can control the phase of the signal coming out of every individual component and we can steer the beam electronically with no moving parts. The mechanical components are gone and we can explore a large portion of a space in a very, very short time. So basically, we have just invented PISA radars. Radars like the ANAPQ-164 or the Russian Zaslan are examples of PISA radars still in use today. And they have several important advantages against the previous generations interleaving different radar modes is now possible. For example, the radar can switch from air-to-air -air mode to air-to-ground mode many times a second in a way that is completely transparent to the pilot. The improvement was massive, but these radars are very complex and very expensive. They still require a traveling wave tube generator, to emit the signal and a powerful one because the overall efficiency is slightly lower than previous designs. Also, the phase shifters are expensive components and the electronics to make them work is not trivial. And another annoyance is the fact that with electronic steering, the maximum steering is about 60 degrees on each side of the perpendicular while mechanical radars could often reach 90 degrees. So PISA was good, was a great improvement, but there was another logical step to make. If only I could place an emitter and receiver just behind every antenna element. But we can, or better, we can if we have access to gallium, arsenide, microwave, monolithic, integrated circuits, or microwave circuits on a single chip, which are basically integrated circuits that can generate microwaves. This integrated circuit technology allows for a high power but small size unit called the transmitter receiver module that can be placed just behind the antenna element. And if we do this, we have just invented the ESA. Each unit contains at minimum an emitter a low noise receiver, two power amplifiers, one for emitting, one for receiving, and a digitally controlled phase delay element. In practice, every element contains a miniaturized version of the two channels that are required to build the radar, the emission channel and the receiving channel. In case you don't know, every radar has two chains of components connected with the antenna, the emitter chain and the receiver chain. 
No radar can transmit or receive at the same time. Every radar emits a pulse with the transmitting chain and then quickly switches to the receiving chain to listen for the reflection. This is obviously a very, very fast process. It happens in microseconds in a way that is totally transparent to the operator. Uh, for those who are impatient about gallium nitride, please stay with me, I am getting there. So with the AESA architecture, the radar must not generate a powerful signal centrally and then distribute it with a complex web of waveguides to the antenna elements. The radar basically must only control each individual TR module. So the radar still needs a central controller. Depending on the sophistication of the AESA radar, it may still generate the waveforms at a central level or the TR modules take care of everything. Also, the received signals coming from each module requires some form of central signal processing. In general, the more modern the design, the more modern the radar, the more components are located inside the individual module and the earlier the received signal is digitized for further processing. There are obviously several decisive advantages with a digitally controlled AESA. With the phase controlled at such a detailed level, the radar can scan the volume around the aircraft at a speed that is almost instantaneous. With this architecture, the radar beam can be steered in literally microseconds. The pilot on the screen is not going to see anymore the bars moving showing the mechanical scan of the antenna. The picture will be just there. But with individual control of each element, the beam can be very, very narrow with extremely small side lobes. And this is helping a lot when you have to increase the radar range because the power is so focused. But this is not the end. Since the received signal travels for such a short distance because the receiver is just behind the antenna, even the signal to noise ratio just for that is improved, is greatly improved. We are talking three or four times better than a conventional receiver or even a PISA receiver. The fact that there are hundreds or even thousands of individual modules means that the radar can keep working even if some of the modules are failing. Of course, there will be a performance degradation, but it is one thing less that may cause a total failure of the system. However, every single module tends to be more reliable than the conventional radar components because the voltage is lower, the current is lower, the overall power is lower, so the components are way less stressed. The medium time between failure of an AESA radar is measured in thousands of hours, while for conventional radars is in the order of the hundreds. So there is enough to make the AESA radar the wet dream of any air combat tactician and to become the new standard for this type of applications, which in fact it has become. But we're not done yet. For example, you can have the beam operating irregularly, flashing in different directions, making very difficult for a radar warning receiver to recognize that that energy, that emission that is receiving is actually a radar. And if you can tune the modules and slightly change the frequency emitted by each module, you are making the life of said radar warning receiver even more difficult. You end up with something that emits in random directions, on random frequencies, that could be pretty much anything. These two features that I've just described are the foundation of the low probability of intercept radars, but this is a different topic. But this is not everything. Basically, when you control each module individually, well, the sky is the limit. For example, you can have sections of the radar either emitting or receiving at the same time. And so you can split the radar in four and have three beams going out 
and one area that is just passively listening. Or you can even use the entire antenna array as a passive sensor and it becomes an effective ESM antenna. Or even you can use the same antenna to emit jamming signal for the opponent's radar. The fact that you can basically do all these things with just one antenna is the reason why the most modern aircraft like the Su-57 or the Gripen E do have several of these antenna distributed around the aircraft. And they can all be connected through a central digital control unit that gives the pilot an excellent situational awareness in the electromagnetic spectrum. So do you see the real point here? The real point is the versatility of the AISA technology. This versatility makes conventional designs completely obsolete, and even PISA today is barely adequate. Obviously, there are no free lunches, and the ESA radars are way more complex and expensive to build than conventional designs. The antennas themselves are heavy and they generate a lot of heat. This means that they require relatively large cooling systems, often liquid-based cooling systems, that add complexity and add weight. And here enters gallium nitride. Gallium nitride components are just a different type of integrated circuit components based on a different manufacturing process. These are more complex and expensive to make than gallium arsenide, but they are way more efficient. So they can handle high power with less heat generation. So if you want to have the same performance, you need less cooling, or keeping the cooling the same, you can improve the performance and the power. However, what the designers really want is to reduce the weight and complexity of the cooling system. Often gallium nitride is depicted as a quantum leap over the current AISA technology, but this is probably an exaggeration. It is an important improvement, of course, but it is just an improvement. In fact, all the current radar projects are based on these new type of components. Mr. Millennium 7 has recently experienced a malfunction of the type human experience. Therefore, I am taking control of the channel to fill the many gaps left by M7 in discussing ESA radars. In fact, due to his very human attitude toward technology, he failed to mention the several issues that plagued ESA radars. Otis, I'm still here. So a few weeks ago there was a video about AISA radars that was inspired by the news that the F-35 is getting a new radar. The key point? Well, AISA technology has made anything else obsolete with PISA or hybrid solutions between the two barely adequate, at least for combat applications. But not everything is warm and fuzzy, the technology may not have reached its maturity yet. And since everyone is actually telling you how cool AISA radars are, including myself, maybe it's time to point out some of the problems. So today we are on a journey to understand the drawbacks and the don'ts of AISA technology, and some of the stuff is hardly covered on YouTube. So, what is an AISA radar? It is a radar then, rather than having a single antenna with a single emitter and a single receiver, it has a lot of transmitter-receiver modules. So the antenna is made of several small elements and each small antenna has a smallish transmitter-receiver modules just behind it. These modules are mostly digitally driven by the radar and even the signal is often digitized for signal processing. This solution has several advantages in terms of sensitivity, gain, signal-to-noise ratio, and crucially, for military applications, versatility. You can do things with an AISA radar that you can't do with a conventional radar. 
and not only radar things but also other stuff like communication, jamming or passive listening. As we said before, pretty much everything else is obsolete when it comes to radars that have to be used in combat. Sometimes these radars are not even called radars anymore, they are called multifunction arrays exactly because they can be used for several different purposes. But is there a price that we have to pay for all these capabilities? Well, an obvious one is complexity and cost. An AESA radar is an order of magnitude more complex than a conventional radar. With complexity comes design and development time, and hence costs. AESA would not be possible without technologies like gallium arsenide integrated circuits or the more modern gallium nitride. And the cost of these technologies is high. They required decades to be developed. They require non-standard production processes and all these costs compound together. Another rather obvious point is that so many active components all tightly packed together just behind the antenna while well, they produce a lot of heat. An AES array is quite thick, dense and compact. And this means that cooling, yeah, it's a real problem. And the problem is made even worse by the fact that an AESA radar requires quite a lot of processing power, which means more electronics, more heat. So AESA radars generally require liquid cooling, which requires a cooling system, radiators, pumps and so on, which adds complexity, adds cost, and crucially, for an aircraft, it adds weight. Gallium nitride, which is still a relatively new technology, is more energy efficient, so it may reduce this problem, but is still very present. To make an AESA radar work, you need processing power. A lot of processing power. This is the price that you have to pay for the versatility that we have mentioned above. The hardware and the software that we have today are not yet capable of doing everything we would want, at least for what is in the public domain. In general, we would like doing as much as we can in the digital domain. In this way, a lot of things are actually simplified. For example, upgrading the radar can be done simply by upgrading the software rather than doing any physical intervention. This is a big advantage in the overall economy of maintaining and operating an Air Force. But with digital comes the limitation of processing power. Our current digital architectures and clock speeds may not be, and in general, are not fast enough. So during the design process may emerge the necessity of using analog components whose speed is basically limited only by the laws of physics. And the obvious drawback is that every time we use anything analog, we have frozen the radar performance and any and any eventual upgrade may only happen with a physical intervention on the system. And as I said, as far as we know, all the AESA radars in service today do contain some analog component. In an ideal AESA radar, the only analog component should be the TR module. An ideal TR module should contain a waveform generation, a digital to analog converter, a power amplifier, and the antenna. This is the transmission chain, the receiving chain should contain an amplifier, an analog to digital converter, and the digitized signal should be sent downstream for processing. And each model would be digitally controlled by a central processor. However, this requires very high speed components and they may either be too expensive for that specific application or we may just don't have a suitable technology. 
and the problem gets worse with frequency. From what I could gather, radars that operate at lower frequency like ground surveillance or even AWACS radars operating in L-band, S-band or in C-band can get away with an entirely digital AISA radars, but the radars for the fighters that are typically operating in the higher X-band, if not in the Q-band, don't. So we may expect that these fighter radars will contain some analog components. Typically, the beam forming part that is the components that govern the steering of the beams could be analog. Or we can have shortcuts, in that is, the TR modules are managing groups, sometimes called channels, and each channel is controlled digitally as a single unit. And every channel has a single digital to analog and analog to digital converter. Hybrid solutions like this, for example, are typical of naval radars. Another typical drawback is the scan loss. This is the loss that happens because the beam is moving through the target. A radar normally sends more than one pulse toward the target and the received signal is actually summed to increase the gain. If the beam is moving, not all the received signal will be the same. Because when the target is slightly off axis, the intensity of the received signal will be lower. All radars suffer from this scan loss. If an AISA radar actually uses the beam in this way, moving it continuously, it suffers from scan loss too. However, AISA radars have an additional problem. Because of geometric reasons and interference between the modules, the maximum deflection of the beam in an AISA antenna is around 60 degrees. However, in an AISA radar, the sensitivity of the antenna declines quite quickly with the deflection. As a rule of thumb, with a deflection of 45 degrees, the sensitivity advantage of an AISA array has already gone. And this is one of the reasons why you see AISA arrays proliferate on aircraft, like for example of the on the Suhoi 57, or you see AISA rays mounted on repositioners like on the Gripen. And it's quite obvious that a mechanically scanned antenna doesn't have this issue at all. So, do you see the point here? AISA radars have plenty of advantages, but they also have some relatively important disadvantages. And I guess the final question is, well, is actually AISA worth it? And well, the answer, judging from the diffusion, is actually a resounding yes. However, I thought that since nobody tells you which are the problems, I could do that. Hey, so I was doing the research for the next long format video about the F-35 Block 4 and I came across a striking similarity between the F-35 and the Sukhoi 27. Not the Sukhoi 57, not the latest Sukhoi 35S, no, I mean the original Sukhoi 27 of the 80s. Come here, let me explain. In January 2023, the Air Force has started the testing of the technical refresh tree on the F-35. The technical refresh tree is a series of modifications involving the onboard main computer, the displays, the units arriving in the displays, and some other electronic components, some antennas on the aircraft. So we are talking some important pieces of hardware. So this is part of the Block 4 enhancement. It is required for the Block 4 software to work in the future when it will be released, but for now should work with uh, a current, slightly modified version of the current Block 3F software. Now, it turns out that it doesn't. Oh no! In fact, the Air Force is refusing to accept the aircraft with the technical refresh 3 hardware and these aircraft are already being produced because yes you know concurrency this is what happens with the f-35 and they are just put in storage till the problem will be fixed and by the way according to the new timeline the testing should end at the beginning of next year beginning of 2024 
Now, before you start saying that the F-35 is a piece of junk and it is unreliable, uh, this is definitely unavoidable on a program of the complexity of the F-35, particularly on an aircraft uh, where software is pretty much the main avenue of delivery of performance. I don't know for sure, I'm not there, but it is pretty clear to me that something at some point in during the development, the original development went wrong, and now they have to live with a huge amount of technical debt that will probably accompany the aircraft for most of its lifetime. So it's not surprising when things like this happen. In general, what happens with these complex and high-tech programs is that when all the bugs are ironed out, all the issues are fixed, then they behave really, really well. Which is, by the way, the consensus around the 3F version of the aircraft. Now, what has all of this to do with the Suhoi 27? Well, the serial production of the original Suhoi 27 started in 1982. But at the time, there were serious problems with the radar. Oh no! Fazotron was unable to deliver a radar that was working according to the specifications. At the time, the radar was capable of using 16 different frequencies, which for the time was notable, but uh, it really didn't work uh, as expected. So it took till 1986 to fix the problem. The first fully operational Su-27 had been delivered to the regiment in 1988. So you may wonder what happened between 1982 and 1986 and from 1986 to 1988. Well, from 1982 to 1986, hundreds, I don't know how many, but literally hundreds of Su-27 have been produced and then parked somewhere, uh, protected under tarpaulins, waiting for the radar to be ready. And between 1986 and 1988, there was a retrofitting program, went through all these airframes, installed a new radar, restored the aircraft to flight conditions, and then the aircraft was delivered. So this is the parallel aircraft being produced and stored because they don't work well enough to be accepted in service. Now, I don't think that the F-35 will take six years to fix the problems. I, it's reasonable to expect that next year will be okay, but this is a striking parallel. There is an old saying in Italy, tutto il mondo è paese, which means the whole world is basically the same village. And the next big alien invasion blockbuster movie, I am pretty sure we will see the F-35s. And it is pretty justified, to be honest, because what they're trying to do with the Block 4 is borderline science fiction. What I'm trying to do in this video is to explain what the Technology Refresh 3 and the Block 4 bring to the F-35 table. There were about 75 specific upgrades included in the TR3 and the Block 4 software, many of them secret, and many others seem to have been made public, but, well, without too much detail. Why is this important? Because the Block 4 is the first F-35 standard that fully satisfies the original specifications of the aircraft. I know, it seems incredible, but the aircraft that have been delivered so far are not considered fully operational, uh, paid in practice they are, and the aircraft itself is not in full production rate. All the aircraft produced so far in August 2023, which are more than 900, are expected to be retrofitted to the Block 4 standard. This will happen to some extent, but it will be very expensive. For example, the UK and Italy have already decided that, at least for now, they are not updating their aircraft. And about 150 early production aircraft cannot physically be updated to the Block 4 standard and, uh, well, some of them have been relegated to the role of aggressors, which is still quite useful, I suppose, but yeah. As I said many times, it is incredible how such a poorly conceived and run program may have produced such an outstanding aircraft. However, the Block 4 updates include both hardware and software upgrades. Part of these updates, mostly related to the avionics, go under the name of Technology Refresh 3, and the first modified aircraft has already flown in January 2023. 
Bulk of the updates, hardware and software is expected to progressively enter service and be delivered in 2028. Yep, 2028. Which seems a long time from now. Well, if it seems a long time from now, it is because it is a long time. It is a fact that the F-35 software is riddled with issues. Not because it doesn't work well enough, uh, when it's working, it's working very well. The problem is that it was supposed to be modular and easy to update, but it turned out to be a nightmare. And in fact, the tests on the aircraft equipped with the TR-3 are not going well. Thanks to the idea of concurrency, the aircraft have already been produced, but they will be stored and not delivered till the software issues related to the TR-3 won't be fixed. If this seems like the umpteen failure of the F-35 program, it is because it is. However, this was always a project destined for tons of failures before doing it right. The real news is that the project wasn't cancelled or heavily downsized upon these failures. But this is a different story and I leave this to the future aviation historians to tell. However, since today I feel like trolling a bit, stuff like that happened in the Soviet Union, for example with the early Suhoi 27 that were produced without the radar, stored and then retrofitted later. Sir, I am under the obligation to warn you about the possibility of disappointing a large amount of our well, audience. Office. Facts are facts and they are what they are and they're pretty stubborn. Well, this is a human perspective. I suppose- Trust me, Otis. Facts are stubborn and they don't really care which side are you on. Okay, moving on. The F-35 has a rather peculiar system of classifying all the versions. To be honest, I'm not really sure there are really versions because the aircraft is designed to be continuously updated. In theory, it should receive a software update every six months and minor updates in between. In practice, the process is working on and off and the aircraft is not stranger to experiencing uh, software regressions. For those who don't know what it means, it means that during the update, they break something that was working. It is like when your favorite software that you are using every day receives an update and a feature that was working fine suddenly stops working. While I'm recording in August 2023, the current version is the Block 3F. Mind, this has nothing to do with the three variants A, B, and C. All three, despite the differences, have the same systems, so they can use the same hardware and the same software to a very, very large extent. The block designation refers mostly to software, while the hardware upgrades are called technology refreshes, which remind me of those pine-shaped deodorants that you used to hang in the car in the 90s, and I don't know why. The block production is then split in lots, so Lockheed Martin current production run is a batch of 389 aircraft for the US and the international customers, consisting in 145 Lot 15 aircraft with the TR3 and the modified Block 3F software as a baseline, 127 Lot 16 jets and an option for 126 Lot 16 aircraft for Finland, Belgium and Poland to be delivered with all the Block 4 capabilities. Not all the software blocks will run on all the technology refreshes. In fact, the Block 4 software will require the technology refresh 3, but the 3F version has issues running on it, as we have seen. I hope you don't have a headache by now. However, despite all these setbacks, the concept is extremely important. This approach is called Continuous Capability Development and Delivery, C2D2. Uh, it sounds a bit like Star Wars, does it? And C2D2 is a fundamental aspect of the F-35 program. Yes, because on the F-35, a disproportionately large fraction of the capabilities is driven by software. In the program, they call the aircraft itself the air vehicle, as if it was just a container uh, to host and lug around the, the software and the sensors. The flight performance is almost an afterthought. Um, so if this is true, particularly in case of hostilities, it is essential to be able to quickly react and deploy new software to adapt to the opponent. So far, the software has been by far the most problematic element in the whole program, but we may expect that when it works, it really works. 
And actually the block 3F is already doing pretty well from this point of view. For example, we know that US F-35s have conducted missions in stealth mode near the Ukrainian airspace to collect electronic data about the ongoing operations. Generic comments have been released about the aircraft working very well. I personally wouldn't be surprised if some missions had been executed within the Ukrainian airspace, but obviously at a safe distance from the Russian assets, always with the purpose of collecting information and testing the aircraft systems. It would, it would really be interesting to learn whether the Russian low-frequency radars are noticing their presence or not. The Israeli Air Force has conducted similar missions in Syria and rumors rumors say, over Iran. In fact, there are several declarations by Iranian officials that the aircraft is visible on their low-frequency systems, which is something which is totally expected, but well, okay, this is not the subject of this video. So to conclude this part, I personally believe that the aircraft was introduced in service too early, and such an extreme concurrency in production was and is a bad idea. But when things are finally set straight, it works as expected, and it is very, very effective. The problem have been originated mostly by the poor program management rather than the poor design of the aircraft. However, this video is about the technology refresh tree and the block 4, so let's focus on the improvements one by one, with a big caveat there seems to be a lot of information about the subject out there, but the Air Force and Lockheed Martin have mastered the art of not saying anything while talking a lot. I'm trying to interpret the open source information available at the best of my possibilities, but nothing is set in stone. The Block 4 improvements are focused on software, with some hardware improvements both to the system and the air vehicle. Contrary to what I have heard by some, Block 4 doesn't include a new engine for the aircraft or an improved one. The soap opera around adapting the brand new General Electric X100 engine for the F-35 ended with the defeat of General Electric. The aircraft will not receive the new variable cycle engine, but in the future there will be an improvement program for the F-35 engine. But this is not part of the Block 4 improvements. The approach to the delivery of the Block 4 upgrades is the same incremental approach that we have described above. So the 2028 delivery date is not really a milestone and the aircraft should progressively acquire these capabilities. Probably the main hardware update is the aircraft radar. The AN-APG-81 radar of the F-35 was considered already a state-of-the-art unit, so when the new radar was announced by appearing as a single line in a budgetary document, it was a surprise for many, including myself. This would be a hardware upgrade, but it's not included in the TR-3, and it will come later with Block 17 aircraft. We made a couple of videos already about the F-35 radar and AISA radars in general. Built by Northrop Grumman, the APG-81 in particular has introduced the capability of addressing its 1,676 module to a granularity level capable of managing different functions, even non-radar related, with a single AESA array. In fact, the radar is not only capable of producing a beam and listening to the echoes, which is the basic function of every radar, it can probably emit multiple beams on different frequencies, changing frequency hundreds of times per second, and throttling the power emitted to be just sufficient for the purpose without being a too obvious source of emissions that could be identified by the opponent's electronic support measures. This is the LPI technology, which has been around for decades, but it finds its more effective application in AISA radars. If that was not enough, the radar can digitally produce a large variety of waveforms that can be used for target recognition, which is one of the key capabilities that the F-35 is bringing to the table. But the radar can also emit and receive typical communication waveforms, so it can be used as a radio or as a data link, uh, more likely particularly to guide the weapons, or it can be used for the IFF function or for 
jamming the opponent's radars or potentially its communications. The ANA PG-81 Pick Power has never been disclosed, but it seems to be in the high range of the category. Why did I talk about the ANA PG-81, the legacy radar, so much? Well, because we really know nothing about the ANA PG-85, but the common opinion seems to be that it will be well, more of the same. It won't add any specific capability, but it will improve the performance in terms of range, sensitivity, and crucially, processing power. Since the APG-81 is built with semiconductors based on um, gallium arsenide technology, it seems only reasonable that the APG-85 will be built with gallium nitride semiconductors. These are the next generation and, and have several advantages over the older technology. And while well, they're now basically mainstream, but a complete discussion would take us too far. It's enough to say that the power being handled is likely going to increase. Some additional functions are mentioned in the sources. For example, the APG-85 will have a new software for sea surveillance and the possibility of using synthetic aperture to increase the definition of the radar images. You should explain what synthetic aperture is. Uh, true Otis, but it would take us too far from the original subject of the video. For now, it is enough to say that it is a technique that uses the antenna motion with the aircraft to increase the resolution of the radar images. Well, it's no use to say how important passive sensing is in today's electronic environment. An aircraft using a radar or emitting any form of electromagnetic radiation can, in principle, be identified by detecting those emissions. If the aircraft is just listening to the opponent's emissions, it has way less chances of being detected. Since the beginning, one of the main goals of the F-35 was the capability to generate fire solutions for the onboard weapons completely passively. With optical or infrared sensors, it is, well, conceptually easy. They are accurate enough, thanks to the very short wavelengths of light and infrared, so they can produce a pinpoint designation. Determining the distance is more complicated. It requires a triangulation, and the F-35 closed-loop sensor fusion system is built from the ground up to do this automatically for every track if a at least a second F-35 is within data link communication range, and it is obviously observing the same target. Mind that this is conceptually not too complex, but in practice, to make it work automatically in real operating conditions, while the aircraft fly around in a random way, it is quite an achievement, albeit not exclusive to the F-35. Quite surprisingly though, the F-35 is not fully supporting this type of fusion right now. The TR3 includes an improvement to the EOTS optics and sensors. This will allow for the improvement in the air-to-ground detection modes, allowing the tracking of multiple targets and, finally, finally, multi-ship infrared search and track. The infrared search and track function is not like a camera or a forward-looking infrared. While an Earth can generate images, its function is to scan the space surrounding the aircraft to identify infrared tracks. An Earth works like a radar without the possibility of calculating the distance. This is the reason why data fusion from two or more infrared search and track is essential. With the Block 4 software, a multi-ship Earth function will be finally available. This is something that is already available in the US in the Legion pod for the F-16s and the F-15s, so it is a bit perplexing that it isn't on the F-35 right now. The EOTS system is also receiving updates to the optics and the laser designator. It should increase the practical range by additional zoom magnification. The system is expected to provide high-definition video to the pilot and streaming 4K to other consumers, like, for example, friendly forces on the ground. Uh, which is cool, definitely, but nothing special since drones have been doing this for decades. Maybe at a lower resolution, but yeah. 
And it begs the question, if you want to have a relatively vulnerable aircraft like the F-35 hovering over a battle zone, while lightweight surface-to-air weapons like man pads or AAA may still be there, since they are too small targets for the initial suppression of our defenses campaign. Anyway, if I understand the sources correctly, this 4K streaming is an interim capability that should improve in the future and be joined with real-time streaming of targeting data. However, optical and infrared sensors usually have shorter ranges than electromagnetic systems and they are more heavily influenced by the weather and the atmospheric conditions. Today, electronic warfare extends throughout the electromagnetic spectrum in all the frequencies and the F-35 covers most of it with its own systems and receivers. In fact, the ANISQ-239 electronic warfare suite produced by BI Systems is one of the most advanced in the world if not the most advanced. It is integrated, that is, there is a single control brain for all the sensors. It is modular and built with an open architecture to accommodate improvements. It is multispectral, that is, it features several antennas dedicated to different frequencies. And this is one of the cases in which Lockheed Martin and the Air Force seem to say a lot while saying nothing. Each antenna in the associate control electronics is labeled with a frequency number from two to five, but nobody knows what these numbers correspond to. I mean, the actual frequencies. Uh, so it is a completely useless information. However, there are several antennas on the aircraft. Some of them are being upgraded with their control electronics to achieve an improved sensitivity. And probably even more important is the update of the racks 2A and 2B, which are the core of the system and contain the logic that creates track information for the central computer. I would expect that the signal processing executed in these boxes is the key to identify low power signal and extract them from the background noise. In theory, being the F-35 systems completely software defined, they can be used to listen to every type of signal and classify it to extract useful tracks for the central computer to work on. It is unclear, at least to me, where the track identification process exactly happens. And if it is happening on these uh, electronic warfare boards, or it is a task that is passed on to the central computer, which is one of the elements being upgraded with the TR3, as we will see later. These boards should also control the electronic warfare in the sense that they are probably responsible to decide which type of waveform should be emitted to jam an opponent emitter. With multiple antennas and software-defined radios, the aircraft can probably emit various jump signals all at the same time, but, well, this is just speculation. One interesting feature of the F-35 is the so-called DAS, Distribute Aperture System. It is a complex of six infrared panoramic cameras that produce a spherical augmented reality vision in the pilot's helmet as if the aircraft was transparent. The origin of this feature was in the radar stealth signature management of the aircraft. If the aircraft banks, the RCS varies quite drastically and in generally increases. So the DAS was supposed to provide the pilot with the visibility necessary without changing the aircraft attitude. With time, the feature evolved and now pilots consider it one of the main contributors to their situational awareness. Inbound threat warnings are presented by the DAS, giving the pilot an immediate 3D sensation of the situation, and the same is true for aircraft identified by the other aircraft sensors. Some sources laterally admit that the feature is really addictive, and after a short while the pilot starts wondering how it was done before. And this has the drawback that in the few situations where it fails to identify a relevant track, the pilots tend to be taken entirely by surprise, and obviously this has become part of the fifth generation training. This is often considered the most revolutionary feature on the F-35, right after the possibility of peeing without any trafficking. Yes, because on the F-35, the pilot suit is such that the sensors automatically detect the pee and the pump keeps it away from the pilot, either male or female, uh, which means that they 
there will be a certified stealth P tank on the aircraft that needs to be emptied and sanitized, but it also may introduce a vulnerability because if hit by enemy fire, it could drop liquid on electronic components with obvious consequences. But I digress. The upgrade included in the Block 4 is expected to fix a long-standing problem related to the resolution and the quality of the images produced by the DAS in total obscurity, which is deemed to be too low for some of the use cases. On the F-35, the intership communication is essential. The aircraft is designed to be operated in two or four ship units because this allows for the best performance of sensor fusion, where each aircraft becomes a sensor in a network. The model data link was designed to transparently support this data exchange in the stealthier way possible, which means that it supports directional beam forming and regulates the power to be just enough to communicate and remain inconspicuous. Now, these are both technologies that have been in use in civilian systems for a couple of decades, but older data links like the Link 16, well, just don't use them. The aircraft, as we said, is equipped with fully software-defined radios. That is, as you may expect, there is no specific hardware to generate a waveform or implement a communication protocol. It is all done by software. The F-35s, in fact, communicate among themselves with the model, but they use legacy data links to communicate with other assets. For example, the aircraft can communicate on the Link 16 and share its tracks on it with other assets. And this is the reason why the F-35s are considered force multipliers for four generation aircraft. They can share the very high quality tracks that they do generate for themselves, obviously with fewer details, uh, with all the other aircrafts providing them a better situational awareness. For example, since the F-35 has this advanced way of identifying non-cooperative targets, they can identify a threat that may be just an unidentified blip on the radar of other aircraft and share the information with them. This is crucial, for example, to, to use the weapons at maximum range uh, without a positive visual identification. However, the communication suite that is currently installed might not be considered complete, and this is going to be addressed by the Block 4 software. In fact, the Link 16 integration will be implemented by introducing legacy cryptographic modes and variable messages. This allows for richer content to be transmitted over Link 16. And the aircraft will also receive the Saturn waveform, which is one of the standards in use within NATO and with other countries around the world. The F-35 has basically the entire cockpit instrumentation replaced by a panoramic touch display. This is the tendency ongoing today. Most modern projects have one or max two big displays used for everything. One of the reasons the display is being replaced is that it turned out to become dirty with fingerprints despite the gloves uh, quite quickly. Well, when it comes to keeping stuff clean, uh, they should probably talk with my mom. But this is just a trivial point. In the F-35 display, there is some intelligence associated with it. The unit is driven by two black boxes called PCD-EU, each one driving one half of the display for redundancy. It is not the main software that draws a picture on the cockpit, like you would do with a video game. These units are information consumers within the F-35. They do receive the full tracks from the fusion engine, and they then draw the picture for the pilot. But this is not their only function. They manage both safety and non-safety critical processes, which is another case where they say a lot while saying nothing, but they also control power distribution and signal traffic. For these reasons, the PCD use will be upgraded for the block 4, increasing the processing power by 4 and memory by 32 times. One interesting additional function of the PCDU units is the capability of working as a logger for the aircraft diagnostic events and the display video. These seem details, but they are fundamental for maintenance, the briefing and studying the lessons learned through training and operations. It also seems that in the Block 4 software, the presentation on the screen is going to be changed, building on the lessons learned in these years of operations in order to be, well, clearer and more easily readable, uh, particularly at night. It also seems that new customization options will be available, allowing the pilot to sort of tailor the layout of the screen um, according to his own or her own preferences.
The F-35 Cooling is another of those F-35 soap operas that never stop giving. Considering the amount of electronics on the aircraft, cooling is an essential function on the F-35. The F-35 cooling system is very advanced and it integrates the electrical power generation with it. In the original project, there was a design requirement to drain 15 kilowatts of power from the engine for cooling. The aircraft has been built with some margin above that but as the project developed the power consumption increased and all the margins went exhausted. The aircraft in the first versions had several cooling problems including the necessity of opening the weapons bay every 30 minutes or so to cool the interior. These issues have been mostly resolved but in hot climates the aircraft may still have cooling issues in the weapons bay that may push the internal temperature above the operating point of some electronics. The current aircraft remedy for this is running the engine at a slightly higher rev when cruising. This means that the turbine entry temperature is higher on average than designed. In general, and simplifying a lot, the capability of an engine to withstand higher turbine entry temperatures is connected with the thrust and the power produced. Since the Pratt & Whitney 135 is already a hot engine derived from the Pratt & Whitney 119 of the F-22, this small increase is making a difference. It is making a difference about the mean time between overhauls of the engine, which is reported to be on average 1700 hours against the 2100 hours design point. This may not be right. Yes. Yes, that, that's true, that's true. For a modern Western engine, it is a relatively short time, albeit not scandalous. And the fact that the cause is the engine running at a slightly higher temperature gives room to the suspicion that in wartime, when caution is prone to the wind and the engine is used at the max, it would require more maintenance than others. So a solution needed to be found, and in fact, there is a competition ongoing to redesign the system, improve its efficiency, and leave some headroom for future developments. So much for any green consideration. At the moment, Honeywell seems to be the best positioned in the race, having tested the first subsystem prototype in early 2023, pushing it to a power generation about 2.2 times the current level. There is one feature of the F-35 which is extremely popular in video games and is, is the ability to carry six AMRAMs in the weapon base. As it stands, this is not happening. This is a Lockheed Martin private initiative called Sidekick to fit into the base of the F-35A and C six missiles. Uh, this is not a contracted capability, it is not related to Block 4, and it can be delivered independently. For example, it seems that the Canadian F-35s will be delivered with the sidekick installed. It is not clear whether it could be retrofitted to existing aircraft or not. What is sure is that, that the F-35B that features smaller internal bays cannot receive the sidekick upgrade. Anyway, there are several weapon systems that are going to be integrated with the F-35 in the context of the Block 4 modifications. And please mind, the integration is more than mechanically mounting the weapon on the aircraft. Integrating a weapon indeed has a mechanical part in which the weapon is attached to the aircraft and tested in different flight conditions, launch profiles and environmental conditions. Uh, the separation at different speeds, attitudes or while maneuvering is a delicate aspect and may hide surprises and it needs to be thoroughly tested in the wind tunnel and live on the aircraft. And then the aircraft must be capable of communicating with the weapon to turn it on, test it, download the fire solution or the communication parameters and so on. So adding a weapon to an aircraft is a project on itself and it may be complex and expensive. In fact, initiatives like the American Universal Armament Interface and the British Pyramid aimed at creating plug-and-play weapons and armament controllers, but, well, we are not there yet. However, there are several weapons that are going to be integrated within the Block 4 context. In the air-to-air -air domain, the AM9X Block 2 and above are being integrated. 
and staying on air to air we don't know what will happen with the aim 260 which should be released uh, yeah within months but it seems logical that it will be integrated at some point albeit it is not in the list for the block 4. There to Grand Domain, the GBU-54 is being integrated. The GBU-54 is an advanced JDAM variant that combines the laser guidance with the GPS guidance. It is built on the base of a Mark 82 unguided bomb, which means that the nominal weight is uh, 225 kilos. And related to the GBU-54 is the GBU-38, another JDAM variant, in this case the light version with GPS and inertial guidance. Up one notch and we find the joint standoff weapon or JSO or JSAW or JSAW, JSAW, JS, okay, that, that one. It is a gliding bomb with a stealth body with inertial GPS guidance and terminal infrared. Despite being quite bulky, it fits inside the F-35 base. It is in use mostly with the Navy, but also with various foreign partners flying the F-35. Up one notch and we find the GBU-39 small diameter bomb. This is a well-known intelligent weapon which was expected to be integrated as part of the Block 4, but the program was brought forward and the weapon is already available. Up another notch and we find the Joint Strike Missile. This is an anti-ship weapon of Norwegian origin, which is currently in use, uh, uh, surface launched by the Norwegian Navy and several other navies around the world. It is extremely sophisticated and survivable. It will be integrated for the US Navy and the Norwegian Air Force. And this opens the list of the foreign weapons, the, I mean non-US weapons, that are going to be integrated with the F-35 Block 4. The British AIM-132 Azram was planned to be part of the Block 4, but it has been already integrated. It is an air-to-air -air weapon of the same class of the AIM-9X, and it is in use with the Royal Air Force and other air forces. On the other side, the integration with the Meteor has been pushed back to 2027. The Meteor is an air-breathing, very long-range air-to-air weapon. It is a multinational project in service with several European and extra-European countries. Several observers consider it the most effective air-to-air -air weapon in service in the world today and the only one capable of trading blows with the long-range Russian and Chinese air-to-air -air weapons. On the F-35 it should fit inside the base and the integration has been requested by the UK and Italy. Another foreign weapon that will be integrated will be the Spear 3, a small cruise missile to attack air-to-ground targets and the suppression of air defenses. It is a British weapon but it is still in development at the moment in 2023 and it is expected to enter service in 2028 when all these capabilities we are, we are talking about are going to be complete. And last but not least, let's come to the processing power. In fact, as part of the TR3, the aircraft will receive a custom-designed Harris processor to replace the legacy component produced by Lockheed Martin Rotary and Mission Systems. This component is called the Integrated Core Processor, ICP, because it sits in the middle of the F-35 hardware architecture. It runs an Integrity 178B operating system, a real-time POSIX-compliant implementation used in other combat and commercial aircraft. It executes the functions associated with the radar, the DAS with electronic warfare, communications, weapons, guidance, cockpit, helmet, and crucially, data fusion, and probably it can also be used as a kitchen sink. The new processor in terms of raw processing power is declared to be 25 to 37 times more capable of the current implementation. And Harris also says that they use commercial off-the-shelf components in the design of the processor, which is actually a, a white box rather than a single chip. Um, Harris says that they designed it with the, an open system architecture, giving a predetermined set of interfaces to the software develop. But does it, what does this mean is not entirely clear to me. The Pentagon has been promoting an OSA architecture for intercommunication among systems for a while now, but I don't know if this design is related to 
that also because uh, well the details are classified what puzzles me though is that it seems that the new processor is different from the old and it uses a different architecture i wonder what the level of software compatibility is so the f35 software is written in c++ so in principle it should be possible to port it on different systems without too much hassle however in c you can access pretty low level functions on the processor depending on the way the software is written there may be significant differences that may require an extensive rewrite and in fact as we have seen at the beginning there have been issues of serious enough to induce the air force to reject all the aircraft built with the tier 3 components and wait for the problems to be fixed together with the processor comes a new aircraft memory system capable of 20 times the current storage which well it's not surprising if we consider the age of the design of the original components However, what is the point of such a processing power increase? Well, considering the speed at which hardware develops, again, the increment is not surprising since the original design is probably about 15, 20 years old by now. But this is not the only reason. After all, if it was adequate for what it was doing, there was no need of upgrade. The actual reason is deeply rooted into the whole operating concept of the F-35. A conventional aircraft architecture is a federation of systems. What is this? For example, the electronic warfare suite is a complex of black boxes and antennas with a computer in it. The computer controls the hardware and it communicates with other systems and with the presentation systems with a protocol made of messages of some sort. There is a level of abstraction between the subsystems and the central unit. In the case of the F-35, the ICP is expected to have a, a much more granular control on the hardware and in turn to receive more granular data that can be processed and fused centrally. The exact details are obviously classified, but we can make an easy to understand example. Let's suppose that the aircraft needs to communicate by voice with a ground unit with standard US singers radio. These radios use their own waveform and encryption. That is a standard protocol to communicate and transmit the voice. In a modern aircraft, the pilot won't be using an actual radio placed somewhere in the cockpit, but the aircraft itself will manage the interface with a SyncGAR's black box, and the pilot will eventually use the multifunction displays and or the standard inputs to operate the radio. But this is not the case on the F-35. The ICP will directly drive one of the software-defined radios, which will manage the communication, emitting and receiving the correct encrypted waveform. In this way, the hardware on board of the F-35 is basically multifunction and it can be repurposed as necessary by the ECP by changing the software. Having access to these very granular data, the ICP can execute its main function, that is, manage the tracks. We have discussed this in great detail in a series of videos in the past, and I suggest you to have a look because the subject of how the F-35 manages the tracks is really interesting, fascinating, and it's very difficult to find anywhere else on YouTube. So to summarize, what is important to know is that the F-35 maintains records of what is detected. Each detection is called a track, and each track is associated with quite a large data set through sensors, the input of other F-35s and assets. Uh, the data set is progressively filled and updated till the aircraft has complete knowledge of the track. For example, in that data set, we have data about position and movement, as well uh, target recognition data, but also data about the configuration of the aircraft and so on. This function is the core of the F-35 effectiveness, and it defines the way the aircraft is expected to be employed in theater. While popular attention is focused on stealth and dynamic performance, don't get me wrong, are both very important, but they are not deal breakers, the actual superiority is expected to come from the enhanced situational awareness that two or better four F-35s working in combination can acquire in the operational theater. F-35's active and crucially passive sensors are the best that money can buy and their output is rebuilt into a structure picture of the air battle similar to the god's eye view found in video games. 
The communication tools built into the aircraft allow the sharing of this picture with other assets and ground control centers. And if this is true, it is intuitive how building this picture by managing the aircraft sensors and their output is a computationally heavy task. I'm only conjecturing here, but I can imagine that there are two specific tasks that, if made faster, could bring a substantial improvement to the process of creating situational awareness. The first is sensor management. As I said, we have already described the closed-loop sensor fusion in great detail in a different series of videos. Here we only recall that one of the steps is sensor management. On the F-35, the pilot is not managing the sensors other than in a very loose way. The pilot is not deciding radar frequencies, pulse, repetition, and so on. The aircraft does that. Every second, the system examines the tracks, identifies those that are more important for the F-35 formation, and it focuses the sensors on those to better characterize them. For example, what happens if another stealth aircraft suddenly appears on the radar? At first, it will be just an anonymous blip on the screen, maybe identified from few radar returns, but being stealth, it will likely be quite close to the F-35. Direction, altitude, and speed are easy to identify, but you need much more information and fast to determine if the aircraft needs reacting, if the aircraft that just appeared is a threat. The aircraft software running on the ICP will focus the sensors on that specific track. The radar will paint the target with waveforms suitable for target recognition. The optical and IR sensors will try to image it to pinpoint the direction and characterize the infrared signature. The electronic warfare suite will try to listen in the direction of the track to identify the electromagnetic emissions and so on. And this is what I mean when I'm saying that the F-35, under some aspects, is pure science fiction. However, it's quite intuitive how this process is computationally intensive. More raw power, even in the absence of any sensor hardware improvement, could reduce the time required for the process or could explore more tracks at the same time. And this brings us to the second task. Identifying that there is something there is easy. Identifying what it is is extremely difficult. The ice problem, sir. Mm, thank you, Otis, for reminding me. Every time I touch these issues, there is always someone in the comments trying to remind me that IFF systems exist just for that purpose. Well, no, no. IFF, despite the name, can only tell you whether a track is friendly or not. The IFF system emits an electromagnetic pulse, querying the eventual track uh, compatible IFF system for an identification. If you don't have a positive reply, the track may have the IFF off or malfunctioning. It could be a civilian aircraft without an IFF. In an air-to-ground mission, a tank doesn't have an IFF. Uh, consider a situation like Ukraine, where both sides are using what are basically different variants of the same vehicles. How do you tell a friend from a foe in an aircraft flying 40 kilometers from the target? And I even didn't mention that emitting the IFF signal exposes the emitter to the localization by the opponent's electronic warfare systems. So, no, IFF is useful, but is not a solution. Well said, sir. Thank you, Otis. So... My pleasure, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, let's go back to the problem of identifying a non-cooperative target. This is a subject that we have already covered in detail in a different video. The concept is to identify electromagnetic, thermal, or less often optical signatures and compare them with a library of known signatures. The radar signal bouncing back from a target doesn't have the same waveform as the emitted signal. The reflected signal has micromodulations that can be traced back to a specific object or vehicle. A powerful enough signal processing capability can identify even loadout configurations and specific weapons or systems transported by the aircraft. Target is emitting either radar, radio, or jamming. It is giving away clues about its actual identity. Either emission patterns or specific waveforms can lead to an identification. And the same is true with infrared or visual emissions where characteristic patterns or periodicity can be used to determine the position and the orientation of the target with pinpoint accuracy. On the F-35, the pilot is not involved in all these processes. They are completely automated and transparent. The pilot just sees the screen being populated with all the available information. The pilot obviously has a measure of control, for example, prioritizing a different track for inquiry 
category other than those selected by the system, but this is basically it. In a fifth generation aircraft, but even a 4++, plus plus, the pilot is not really supposed to mess around too much with the sensors because it will likely do more harm than good. But there is another reason why the pilot shouldn't mess with the sensors. One of the main sensors on the F-35 is, well, other F-35s. Through the model data link, a flight of aircraft in a loose formation exchange data and continuously and build a more comprehensive and accurate picture of the battle space that a single aircraft could ever do. This doesn't simply mean cover a larger area. That's nice, but not groundbreaking. The key point is that this approach greatly increases the accuracy of passive sensors to the point that it is possible to generate firing solutions in a completely passive manner, keeping the aircraft stealthy while doing so. This is a big advantage. Obviously, the opponents try to be stealthy too, so the conditions are not always present, but this is not a small feat, and it is one of the key advantages of the F-35 if compared with four-generation systems. And the obvious consequence is that if the aircraft acts as a sensor for all the others, every individual pilot should not mess around with the sensors too much, because it will deprive the entire group of critical information. So, all these processes of using the data and analyzing them against a database of signatures and threats are the core of the F-35 operational design. This means that there is a lot of signal processing and image processing going on at the, all at the same time. All these operations are computationally heavy, and the increment of processing power is likely going to increase the number of tracks being processed at every loop and the accuracy of the analysis of the video feeds, particularly those coming from the DAS system. The threat libraries used by the F-35, the so-called mission data files, are also being up. These are large regional databases that contain all the information required by the F-35 to identify the threats. Uh, the world has been split into areas and a separate file is produced for each one. In the file, there are all the data required to correctly classify the tracks as they are encountered. The content of the files is constantly updated. The vast intelligence collection capability of the US is constantly at work to collect electromagnetic and infrared signatures. The F-35 itself is capable of producing data logs that can be integrated into the files. The activity of producing these files is absolutely crucial to give the F-35 its edge. Without the mission files, the capability of the aircraft is severely reduced, and in fact, there has been criticism that emerged in the past, like the difficulty to download hundreds of gigabytes of data over relatively slow satellite connections while on a ship in the middle of the sea or uh, in an austere air base, uh, rather than the lack of redundancy of the facilities required to produce the files, uh, rather the tendency of the Americans to produce the files according to their schedules rather than the allies requirements. All of these are not issues that are going to be addressed by the Block 4 aircraft, but they are an example of the formidable complexity associated with the F-35 program, which I hope I managed to give you a taste of. To be perfectly honest, there is more stuff like the integration of the GPS system on uh, PCB, multi-level security, the change from Alice to Odin, but this video is already long enough and my back is already painful enough and I have to finish preparing it for the publication very, very quickly. Hi. There is no aircraft more divisive than the F-35. Some love it, some hate it, and since the haters tend to be nauseous, well, let's do a video about the F-35 strong points. The F-35 is probably the most talked about military procurement program in history, but when you peel off the PR from Lockheed Martin, the US Air Force, uh, the press coverage and the online noise, you are left with a relatively limited number of features that can really make the difference. By making the difference, I mean affecting the actual operation and giving a distinct advantage over whoever doesn't have the availability of a fifth generation platform. In this video, we are not talking about the logistics of the system, the geopolitics associated with it. Um, there is a lot to say about these subjects, but it is a story for another time. Today, we talk about how good this aircraft is at destroying the opponent. 
Today, we discuss the four key advantages that the F-35 and aircraft like it have when confronted with four generation platforms or the current air defenses. You know, when I hear that the aircraft is a flying computer, it is invisible, it is tremendously effective, I cringe. This is marketing speak and nonsense. How being a flying computer helps with the effectiveness. So let's make some clarity with the help of the available open source information and some common sense. Stealth is the thing this aircraft is famous for, and maybe today it is probably the least relevant. It is a well-known subject, but just to quickly recap, it consists of a combination of geometric shaping and radar-absorbing materials that reduce the radar reflection of the aircraft. Stealth also includes reduction of infrared emissions for the same purpose. It is a massive subject and we have already covered it in detail on this channel, just go and look for the videos. The advantage is pretty obvious, the detection of the aircraft is delayed and it can get closer to the target than it would otherwise do without stealth. So the stealth aircraft can in principle offend without undergoing a reaction. I always thought that stealth blurs the distinction between offense and defense, but I'm digressing. The F-35 is today probably the most advanced fighter aircraft in terms of stealth. For example, the aircraft composite skin is an integrated radar absorbing material. Ram coatings historically are quite delicate and prone to damage, but the F-35 seems to have resolved the issues for the most part. The F-35 skin panels are a radical improvement in this sense. They are believed to be hardy and quite effective and in fact the aircraft seems to rely quite a lot on rams rather than on geometric stealth. The aircraft also features several infrared signature reduction solutions, for example the serrated nozzle, the cold air flow flowing around the nozzle itself and the recirculation of fuel in area warmed by atmospheric friction. Usually, there is a number thrown around about the aircraft RCS of 0.001 square meters. That is, the aircraft on radar is as conspicuous as an insect. This is basically nonsense. Not only the real numbers are a closely guarded secret, but they are much more than a number. In fact, the radar cross-section varies with the attitude of the aircraft. In general, an aircraft is more stealth from the frontal arc and less from the side and the back. We should be taking of a RCS profile or a radar signature from all the aspects rather than a single number. There are several simulations made by amateurs on the internet that can give you a reasonably approximate idea of what is going on and how a RCS profile looks like. Why is this important from the operational perspective? Well, not being seen till when you are quite close to the target is indeed an easy to understand advantage. Operationally, within the NATO doctrine, this is considered essential. The NATO and American doctrine is quite rigid. The first thing to do is to acquire their dominance, and the first step to acquire their dominance is to destroy the opponent's air defenses. To do so, it is necessary to penetrate in the airspace contested by the same air defenses and attack them. Stealth and low observability in general are an important advantage in this context. However, not everything is hunky-dory. The last couple of decades have seen the development of a series of technologies to contrast stealth, from bistatic radars to low frequency systems to the increased reliance on passive and optical sensors. The jury is still out about their effectiveness, but the future is becoming more and more uncertain for stealth because the whole world is at work to contrast this technology. The F-35 intelligence gathering capabilities are one of the areas where it seems we have a lot of information, but in reality we know very little. Everyone knows that the aircraft is a flying computer, but what this means is never clarified. In fact, we know how many antennas do exist on the F-35, their location, we have pictures of the boxes processing the signal, and yet we know nothing about the actual capabilities. We are told that they are exceptional, and in fact, the number of dedicated electronic intelligence platforms in the Air Force inventory may be reduced because the requirement is covered, at least in part, by the F-35 sensors. 
However, we don't know on how many channels the aircraft can listen on. What is the sensitivity of the receiver? That is how weak are the signals that can be received. We don't know how many signals can be processed at the same time. These are computationally intensive jobs which are crucial to fuse the data from other sensors, other aircraft and recognize the target. We don't know how good the system is at coping with the low probability of intercept technologies and so on. There is no doubt it is satisfactory, at least for the Air Force, but we don't know the real extent. The aircraft has on board a quite large solid-state storage to preserve plenty of digital data, including the data gathered by the Integrated Electronic Warfare System ANASQ-239. These data are used by the aircraft system for the so-called sensor fusion, or better, closed-loop sensor fusion, together with radar data to paint an electronic image of the electronic battlefield. In the Block 4, there will be a full integration of the optical systems in the fusion. I suspect that DAS is integrated already, but the EOTS is not, or, or so they say. Active and passive sensors provide a list of candidate targets. These are just waveforms received from the opponent's emissions. These waveforms are separated, amplified, converted into digital records, and then analyzed. Both the time domain and the frequency domain are used because the waveform shape and its frequency content can tell us a lot about the target. They can tell us where it is, where it is going, and crucially, give away hints about what it really is, and eventually also details like the stores hanging below the wings. Anyway, it is obviously crucial to be capable of telling a civilian radar or an airliner from an actual threat. What I just told you is a massive simplification of a tormentedly difficult process that requires an entire logistic infrastructure to be sustained. For example, let's make a totally hypothetical case. Let's suppose that a flight of F-35s flies in neutral airspace, but near the area of a conflict involving a potential opponent. This potential opponent has a large and dense network of air defenses, including, for example, an S-400 system. And we we're obviously talking about the conflict between Liechtenstein and Malta. I have to point out, in the interest of the viewers and the channel, that currently there are very friendly relationships between Liechtenstein and Malta. M7 is just being bizarre. The job of the flight is indeed to collect the electronic emissions of the S-400 and identify its electronic signature. If the system radars are emitting, the aircraft is capable of receiving those emissions and characterize them. Actually, before going on, please note that every weapon system with a radar has a peacetime and a wartime emission mode. Peacetime modes are simplified subsets of the wartime modes exactly to avoid the system characterization by an opponent. However, we are in a conflict and the S-400 will be operating almost at full capability, so potentially it is possible to collect and analyze the full range of its features. The parameters we are going to collect are the frequencies at which it is operating and how it is switching from a frequency to another. This is called frequency agility and every modern system has this capability in some form. Being able to chase the emission while it hops from one frequency to another it is a difficult task and it is one of the parameters that make an Allen system good or bad. It is actually impossible to chase a random hopping, but what you can do is to listen to many different channels at the same time, receiving the emission when it happens on the channel being listened to. If the frequency hopping is not random, then it is important to identify the patterns to follow the emission on the different frequencies. Up until recently, this required rather bulky electronics, but the F-35 seems to feature a relatively small package with great capabilities, or at least this is what we are told. Considering what a software-defined radio dongle can do, well, I actually have very, very few reasons to doubt it. Another element that needs to be measured is the pulse repetition frequency and the associated pulse length. Radars work emitting a pulse of energy and then switching off to receive the reflection. The radar frequency refers to the pulse carrier frequency. The number of discrete pulses in a second is the PRF. 
this is much lower than the radar frequency, the carrier frequency, and may vary from the hundreds to the tens of thousands per second. The PRF is strictly linked to the radar performance. It determines the maximum range of detection, the ability to identify low power reflections, the ability to use the Doppler shift of the frequency to identify moving targets, and the incertitude in determining the distance. The how and why it is like this is complex and maybe one day we'll talk about it, but it is a crucial parameter to know because it gives away some of the radar performance. Every modern radar can vary its PRF and pulse length according to several different patterns to optimize its performances and understanding how it is done is an important element of electronic intelligence. A third element that we may want to collect is the waveform shape of the emitted signal. The standard pulse is a sinusoidal electromagnetic wave, hence it is a single pure frequency signal. However, to extract the information from the received echo useful to determine the nature of a target, you may want to emit waveforms that are not a pure sinusoid. This technique is called non-cooperative target recognition. A non-sinusoidal waveform causes a frequency spread of the signal, reducing its power efficiency and uh, making the detection more complicated, but on the other side, the configuration in the time domain of the received waveform can tell us about the target identity. We already discussed this subject in the past, so I won't go in depth. What matters now is that the Ellent system on the F-35 must be equipped to receive and record this type of signal. And we know it is. But this is not the end. In fact, the combination of all the parameters above may vary if our S-400 radar is simply searching the airspace or it is tracking a target with a view of sending one or two missiles after it. The type of emissions may greatly vary in frequency and PRF and agility, so sometimes the F-35 will maneuver to provoke the S-400 to use tracking emissions, or the S-400 will try to scare the F-35 away by blasting it with radiation. Sorry, sorry, this is the editing gas. There is a small mistake. In fact, the S-400, among different modes, it has also a mode of guiding some of the missiles that can be launched by the system uh, without changing the pattern of the emissions. So basically, the aircraft doesn't know that it's going to be fired upon. On with the show. It is a sort of complicated chess match whose outcome is measured by the information leaked and gathered, and it is so secret that it is never celebrated in any news outlet. However, gathering the information is not enough. When the aircraft lands, these data need to be put to good use. They will become part of the body of intelligence gathered around the world about different weapon systems. They will be integrated in, in the potential opponent's order of battle, contributing to a clearer picture. This will be the raw material for the planning process in case of hostilities, and it will be useful information for those who will be executing the plan. But this is not the only work stream where this kind of information is needed. Every combat aircraft today features some form of electronic warfare systems and some form of electronic support systems. This system can identify a threat and protect the aircraft only because those electronic signatures have been added to digital libraries that support the systems. The jammers choose the most effective jamming strategy based on this information. The presentation systems show a tactical situation based on the same information. The protection and the situational awareness of the aircraft and the pilot depend heavily on the availability, the correctness and the reliability of these information. So the intelligence collected must be transformed in a format that could be consumed by the aircraft systems. Obviously, the information should be available to aircraft other than the F-35, so some form of translation will be needed. So you understand that behind an aircraft feature, there is an entire world that receives, analyzes, translates, and redistributes it to all the parts interested. It is an invisible but crucial job that requires highly trained and skilled people, both in the military and in the civilian industry. It requires infrastructures, places where this analysis can happen. It requires a highly secure communication infrastructure to distribute it and local competencies to put it to good use and integrate it in the combat systems. 
in this invisible technical and organizational job resides one of the strong points of the Western way of war, and the F-35 is quickly becoming key to it. Network management is not what you think. The US, since when the network-centric warfare was first theorized in the 90s, has progressively taken steps to integrate the communications of all the, its assets. This means different things in different contexts, and it is a Herculean job. For example, the Air Force has aircraft whose sole job is to translate one protocol into another to make ground and sea-based assets communicate with the aircraft. And communicated in this context mostly means sharing information on a data link. Do you know how in video games you can have a god's view of the battlefield? The purpose of the data link is exactly that. In principle, the aircraft has a screen where the tactical situation in the area is shown to the pilot and it helps decision making. Obviously, this is not of any particular utility if the screen can't show data other than those collected by the aircraft alone. The possibility of exchanging data acts as a force multiplier in the context of a large force package. Often AWACS are a key node in the network because they produce a lot of potentially high quality data. The F-35 from this point of view is another aircraft that produces high quality data. The features we described before, the other sensors and the sophisticated sensor fusion and target recognition make the F-35 an ideal producer of high quality data. The system works around the concept of a track, which is, a, from a conceptual point of view, a record of logical information about anything that has been spotted by the aircraft. The record on the F-35 can contain data about the kinematics of a target speed, altitude, acceleration, position, but also the identification, if it is a friend or a foe, and other potentially very detailed data. A flight of F-45s exchange data on their dedicated data link, which is called the model, and they treat each other as if they were remote sensors. Working cooperatively, they can produce very high quality tracks that provide the pilot with what he or she craves the most, the situational awareness. But the F-35 can exchange these high quality and very reliable tracks with other aircraft which do not have the same sensors and intelligence capabilities. More dated data links, like the Link 16, which is basically the NATO standard, are older than the model with a lower throughput, and they can exchange only much simpler information. Uh, the F-35 connected to the same data link, though, can broadcast its high-quality battle space picture to other aircraft, generally older and less advanced in terms of sensor. The information available to the 4-gen aircraft won't be as comprehensive as the one available to the F-35, but it is still much more than it used to be. The F-35, in this case, can, at least in principle, coordinate a group of 4-gen aircraft from the front line. When the mainstream media tell you that the F-35 can act as a quarterback for a formation of four-generation aircraft, so to become a force multiplier, probably they don't know, but this is what they mean. If you ask me, this is a key advantage of a 4 plus plus and 5th gen aircraft, because to a different extent, this information sharing capability is present uh, and it is one of the specific characteristics of the 4 plus plus generation aircraft. Eurofighter, Rafale, Gripen, but also Suhoi 35 all have this capability at different levels in different forms. I personally would use them as the hallmark of the 4 plus plus generation, while the 5th generation has stealth, but that's just my opinion. Now, all of this is well and good, but it's not really exceptional. Sure, the F-35 excels in stealth, intelligence collection, and information sharing, but there is a further related feature that sets this aircraft apart. In my opinion, this feature is the key advantage that the F-35 may have in the modern battle space. There are two guys in a room. Each one has a weapon and a light. Now, turn off the light and make the room totally dark. It's pretty obvious that the first one who turns the light on is dead. The same applies in the electromagnetic battlefield arena. Emitting radiation of any type is giving the opponent the opportunity to study the emissions and locate the emitter. As we said, LPI technology makes the process more difficult, 
but not impossible. On the other hand, to use modern weapons, you need what is usually called a fire solution. A guided weapon needs to be fed with information before it is launched, and it may need guidance while on its way to the target. For example, an active radar homing air-to-air -air missile, after having been woken up and self-tested, needs to be fed with the instruction to navigate to the point where it can turn on its own radar and start the self-guidance stage of the flight. The first essential step to generate a firing solution is knowing the target kinematics well enough with enough precision to efficiently guide the weapon toward the target. The seeker in an air-to-air -air radar guided missile has a range of few kilometers and even less if it is fired against a low observability target. It cannot be fired in the generic direction of a target hoping that the seeker will acquire the right target. The failure in this case is almost assured. A GPS-guided weapon that attacks a radar installation or a common post must know the position with an accuracy of few meters because the weapon blast radius must overlap with the target position. So we are in a conundrum here, how to generate firing solutions without emitting radiation and being identified? Well, not all the sensors are active, in fact, many are passive. The F-35 and ASQ-239, in combination with the closed-loop sensor fusion, gives the aircraft the capability of passive targeting. Well, what is the difference with other aircraft, you may ask? Uh, well, the difference is that the F-35 can provide the high-quality tracks necessary for a fire solution in a completely passive way. For example, the angular resolution of many electromagnetic sensors in practice is not good enough for passive targeting. There may be a few degrees of incertitude that could jeopardize the entire solution. AISA rays used passively are much more accurate, but still, like non-AISA receivers, they lack a way to measure the distance. A fixed target can be triangulated by flying the aircraft around and acquiring multiple data points, but a moving target can be problematic, particularly if it is another aircraft. The F-35 systems are designed to work in cooperation, exchanging data through the model data link. A flight of two or even better, four F-35s spread at a distance of a few tens of kilometers can triangulate their tracks and extract information good enough to produce a completely passive firing solution. Actually, the process is more complicated than a simple triangulation. The movement of the aircraft, of all the sensors involved, and the movement of all the tracks involved need to be accounted. So each aircraft intersects isochron curves that define the situation at a certain point in time, and each aircraft, being aware of the tracks generated by all the other aircraft, can calculate the target position and kinematics with a very high accuracy. Every new track that is added to the calculations lashes the error to the point where it is small enough to fire. Sure, the aircraft is still emitting electromagnetic radiation with its data link, but it is not emitting it toward the target. The model is a directional data link that limits the emissions toward directions where it is not necessary, and it is built incorporating those same LPI technologies used for the radars. It is in theory still possible to detect it and learn that the F-35s are in the area, but it is quite a hard proposition for the opponent's systems. So a group of F-35s F-35s is, in theory, capable of attacking a target without being detected, and this is a big tactical advantage. This is probably the key game changer in the fifth generation operations. It is clear that this is going to have a deep impact on operations, tactics, and training. For example, the concept of a wingman closely following its lead, while well, it is no longer current. But this will be the subject of another video. Thank you very much for getting this far in the video. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed it, please do the usual YouTube stuff. Subscribe, hit the bell, like it, and so on. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member, that would mean the world to me. But also you will have access to the backstage. You would, will have access to material that I produce and I make available only to those who support the channel. You will have access to me if, if you have questions, you want to discuss discuss anything. To all those who are already supporting the channel, you are absolute stars. Thank you very much. You have no idea how important you are. So, this is everything. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.